All right, uh, how do you do? Uh, this is five times hacks macros made coding fun again. Uh, my name is Robert Borghese. I'm an aspiring game developer. I'm currently working on and off on a Unity hacks game called Paradox about a time traveling cat. My goal is to one day develop a Nintendo Switch game, but you know, you gotta first make the game. So I'm working on that. I'm a certified JavaScript simp. I love the language. It gets a lot of crap, but I don't know. It's really easy to monkey patch, really easy to convert strings to functions back and forth. There's something nice about a dynamic language that doesn't try and pretend to be a dynamic language. And I think you'll see that as a theme that I really, really love metaprogramming. And of course, I am a humble worshiper of the glorious hacks language. Praise be to the hacks language. And so I apologize ahead of time if I go a bit too fast when I tested my presentation. It was a little over time. But I guess since we're ahead of schedule, I can, you know, things should work out. So what's covered here is going to be approximately a journey of sort of the development of the macros I've been doing since the beginning of around 2022 and sort of libraries I've developed since then. Uh, this is a good talk for anyone, maybe two years from now, you're interested in hacks, looking for some, you know, insight as to how powerful the macro system can be. Uh, this is a place for you. Uh, I'm not going to be doing anything too technical here. A lot of these things are going to be very simple macro examples, though things get more and more advanced as my progression goes onward. So there should be a little something for everyone here. There will be some code samples at the start to try these things yourself. And yeah, overall, this is a talk about making hacks your dream language. You know, maybe it isn't at the moment, but you can make it possible. So let's go on. A little background before I get into my first uh, instance of hacks macros really making my life a better place. Uh, the year is 2017, I'm getting into C++. I'm trying to do some software development with Qt. And I installed this uh, this like sort of theming library based off of you know the material theme, you know, that one where Google uses where you click on it and the underline comes out and see some of it on the left right here. I install it and Unfortunately, it's not animated, or at least not the way I want it to. And this leads me down this whole path of getting super into animating stuff in code. Uh, eventually, it would lead me a couple months later to creating all my own custom widgets in Qt, as you can see on the left right here. Uh, same sort of design philosophy of material with my own little twist. Uh, is this top one going to play? Let's see if I can click it right here. There we go. I like this little checkbox I have right here where we can toggle between two different states, but they have their own name. And anyway, on the right here is my more recent work on the game I was referring to, where I use a lot of animation to make it look professional and nice, you know, like a, a nice little animated menu system. Now, the reason this is relevant is the first time macros really hit home and made my life so much easier was that time I made a zero cost animation timer with a single line. So a very, very common pattern I would write is something along the lines of some arbitrary animation controller float value. You know, anyone who's worked with animations knows that the best way to do it is have some sort of like value that represents the current place in your animation. And this works great because you can move it forward, backwards. If it's halfway done, you switch it to go in reverse. Things still work out pretty nicely. But uh, there's a lot of code you got to write. I mean, this is just moving forward. Oh, actually, let me turn my laser pointer. This is just moving forward. But of course, float values are a little inaccurate, and sometimes my rate isn't some multiple of one. So I've got to make sure if I go beyond the threshold, I stay at that latest final value of one. And then, of course, I can apply my animation. Say I want to make something fade in and stretch from about 50%, something like that transition right there. I do something where I can take my ratio animation value and you know, run some sort of formula on some like scale or alpha to make it occur. Now, the issue, unfortunately, is if I want to make it go back in something like that, well, then I end up doubling the amount of code I need. I can set my target value to either zero or one, and my animation value would try to normalize itself to wherever that is, which looks great. It's solid. It is really, really consistent. I like it a lot. Like, God, is that a lot of code? Not to even mention, half the time I forget to include the delta time when I'm doing game development. 
Uh, I even forgot it here. I, I forgot it. I had this. So uh, what are my solutions? One thing I could do is I can make a function. This would be a pretty classic way of handling things. The detriment, sorry, I can't really reassign this variable, so I have to do it manually. And then I also have to pass this callback, which may be in a very frequently called update loop. I think a more classic example may be with a class. You'll have an animator class, pass it a rate, pass it a callback, and then we can update it like this and then start and reverse it. But that's a lot of bloat. That's a lot of garbage collection. I don't know. Maybe I just have that performance paranoia. So what I ended up doing was making a macro. This is a very bare bones macro. I just take you know a sort of template of the code I want to just place somewhere. I give it all of these sort of expressions that I might need to modify for each instance, and it's good to go. Pretty bare bones thing. So I can, you know, use my variable, call it like it's a function or method, and then pass whether I'm going towards one or zero and the rate we're moving at. Delta time built in. If I want to add a callback, I can also do so without needing to worry about performance issues with, a, you know, an actual runtime function being passed. I can actually dynamically include it with the final generated code using this expression that you know dynamically checks whether do I have an on change expression. If I do, let's make a little alias to my current value and call the function. And otherwise, we'll just leave it blank. And then I can do something like this. So I, a lot of people don't recommend it when it comes to macros, but I just love putting the expression right in there. But a system that looks more like a, you know, a typical callback may look like this, where we can animate some arbitrary object by having this animation number move based on the should show Boolean. Whew. So uh, a quick shout out to TweenX Core. I love this library. Oh my god, this, imagine what we had before, but you can take any float value, give it a little easing curve. That's the whole reason we do stuff from 0 to 1, so you can just take it, ease it, and then apply it just like this, and boom, everything looks so much nicer. So check that out if you're interested. Uh, now, for you new people who I may have been referring to earlier, you may be wondering, OK, so what you're doing here is you're adding methods to ints and floats. How is that happening? And the answer, of course, is static extensions. Using the using keyword, we can create a module, create a function with that takes the first value as a self value. And then if we use using in another file, we can then just call it like it's some sort of method. And that's pretty cool. That's what TweenX Core uses for a lot of its uh, using functions on floats. Me, on the other hand, I personally adore doing the same thing, but with macro functions, which is possible. If you create a macro function like this, and then you use that, any arbitrary expression can have this method used on it. All you got to do is use this using right here, and you're good to go. Now, perhaps there's a handful of you like me who are thinking, ah, I hate importing stuff. You know, I'm, I'm typing around, I'm writing my code, but oh man, now I'm like down here 2,000 lines down, and I got to scroll all the way back up. I guess the editor can do it sometimes, but you know, sometimes my macro function just isn't registered. Well, the solution is quite simple, import.hx. Just add this file to the top area of your uh, hacks package. Use all the imports you want to apply globally to your project. You know, I mean, a lot of people are going to tell you to be careful. You know, make sure you don't have any conflicts. But overall, I think if you're the one who writes it, you know what's going on. You can check out more information here. And yeah, the important takeaway here is not exactly the uh, hacks macro I was referring to earlier, but the fact it's so easy. It's so nice to configure hacks to work like it's your own language. I, I wish I could just have this move towards feature on every float, every value. And with hacks and import HX, I can. And features, they're important to me. I am someone with a lot of commitment issues when it comes to programming, that is. I, uh, I know a lot of people say like, oh God, another programming language. Ugh. Me on the other hand, I'm like, oh my God, new programming language. Oh. When can I use this? Please, I want this now. Give it to me. And I end up like just getting distracted. I came like focus on a certain project because all of a sudden I'm looking at all these languages thinking, oh man, I wish I could do that. I wish I could do that. And well, that's kind of the point of this talk. This talk is to show you why I don't need to worry about that with hacks. So number two, is it wrong to try and steal a bunch of Kotlin features from my hacks project? 
Now, Hacks is somewhat designed a bit conservatively. I am someone who reads the Hacks evolution repo quite frequently. And in general, from what I can gather from it, Hacks, you know, you know, we'll add some cool features, but, you know, we're not going too crazy. We're not going to add some crazy new syntax if, you know, you can already do the same thing in a very standard way. I mean, on the other hand, though, I, I love features. And there are a couple features, at least, you know, earlier this year where I was like, man, I could really go for some of these. One of those was Kotlin's postfix scope functions. Another one was the as operator. And then, of course, destructuring. And we'll get to each of these one at a time. So Kotlin's scope functions. The concept behind these is that you can take any arbitrary expression, add dot let or dot run dot with dot apply dot also, and then alias that expression into a subscope. Now, uh, if you want a great argument against why you should be a little bit careful with your design, I mean, this is all five of these do about the same thing. Some of them alias the variable, some of them make it a this scope, some of them return the object expression, some of them return the result of the block. That's four of them. I don't know what the fifth one does, but uh, we're going to try and do something similar with hacks. So what I did is I created something like this. Same concept. It's a static extension. We take our self-expression, and then we take the blocking code that happens afterward. And you get this really nice looking sort of response where you can just take your long line of function calls, do dot with. And now we have this safe little scope where you can create our own variable names that are exclusive to the modifications we're making here. We have a shorter variable name. I know when I'm like working with uh, Unreal and I have to define all these components, they all have really long names and I end up doing, oh, my scene component root equals this, my scene root uh, dot position dot blah, blah, blah. Here we can do something way simpler. We just call it it and call it good to go. And so that's one way you can do things. The as operator, very similar. I hate it when I'm typing my expression. Oh no, I need to call a function from a child class. I know this is supposed to be typed as a child, but it's as a base. Oh, now I gotta go to the front, use the parentheses and recast this. In hacks, I gotta type the cast you know, keyword. Probably should do it as a whole function with the safe casting. And again, we can do something very similar to what we did before and have this sort of postfix expression that casts this as it is. Now, unfortunately, it may not be this easy. One of the best sides about Hax's meta programming is it's very type safe. So our safe cast right here actually doesn't take two expressions. It takes an expression and then a complex type. Now, complex type is a little different, and we could pass it like this, but I want to make things as smooth as possible. So I can go ahead and, you know, call upon expression tools and package, and then use this to convert our type name expression to a string, you know, the sky entity, the same as we did right here. And then we can convert that string into a complex type. A complex type, for those wondering, is just like sort of the type path representation before hacks performs the uh, typing phase. You use it a lot in stuff like this. And so now this will compile and work flawlessly. So now we can, you know, make this whole method chain convert kind of similar to how Rust does it with their dot cast feature. And then you just continue onward without an issue. Now here comes the big one. This is where I hit kind of a wall where we're like, oh man, I really got to like stop, think, and start analyzing a lot more of the input that I'm taking in which is uh, unpacking slash destructoring slash deconstructing. That's how C-sharp calls it, I don't know why. But uh, essentially the concept is you're gonna take some expression and you're going to assign, at least in JavaScript's case, we can assign the uh, names of the fields to names of the same uh, properties that we're making. So a simple example would be we take the string and we can get the length just by doing this. And now we have a length variable, which Maybe not that helpful, but a better example would be when you're loading a module in Node.js and you have to, you know, take certain functions. You don't have to like, oh, you don't have to <laughs> take fs and then do fs read file, write file. You just get them directly like this, which makes your code just a tiny bit cleaner. So uh, the way I figured I would design this in hacks would be to create a, you know, another sort of method call sort of extension format where I take an arbitrary amount of arguments of two types of expressions. The first would be sort of an identifier and the second would be a variable declaration. 
plain identifiers would just be assigned to the property of the same name normally as if this identifier already exists in the scope, while variable declarations are explicitly created as new variables. So this would look something like this. We do, we define time. So we're gonna define it at the top of the scope. And then we're going to make a temporary variable to store our expression. And then we'll go through and we'll just assume that this expression has these properties we're looking for and assign them like this. So first things first, we wanna make a macro that can take an arbitrary amount of expressions. We can do so by doing this array of expressions like this. Next, we're going to want to iterate through each expression and analyze whether or not it's what we're looking for. So in this case, we'll use pattern matching. Uh, it gets a bit complicated. Just go to uh, the Hacks API and search for Hacks macro expression definition, and you'll find all the information on how we do this there. But we can you know, take a constant identifier, get its name right there. We'll take a constant variable declaration. We're going to make sure it's just one instance in the list of possible variable declarations, and we'll get its name like that with the pattern matching. Anything else we can do context.error. This will send a compiler error straight to the position where this expression came from. So if you're working in like, you know, some sort of code editor, this will actually give you an error right where the parameter is, which is really nice. So the final thing will look something like this. We're going to want to make an array of all the assignments we're going to make at the top and then, or all the assignments we're going to do in the block of code and all the initialization statements we need. So for both of these, we're going to uh, take our name of our identifier, place it right here, assign it to the identifier in temp. Like I mentioned before, if the cast uh, hacks can sort of ascertain what type of val uh, type it's looking for. So while right here we have to explicitly say, hey, we want to convert our string into an identifier, field access only ever takes strings. So we can just do it directly like this. And so both these have the same sort of thing. We're going to push that assignment into the assigns. The variable declarations will just push the original expression into the, uh, the array because it already should be formatted correctly. And then down here, we're going to sort of create our template for what we want. The merge block metadata is going to simply remove the scoping from the uh, block of code. So we want to do this just to make sure that all of our variables we define right here are at the top scope where we're you know calling this function but everything else does keep the clutter from getting too crazy we just put our temp variable right here and then do all the assignments right here okay so that was a lot but that was pretty cool right we can sort of take this very uh, i guess you could say very simple idea and you know with a bit of logic we can make hacks work a bit smarter and I would eventually take these, the main feature being the unpacking, and create my first library called Hacks Extra Features. That's an arbitrary amount of you know, features here and there to uh, you know, make your life just a tiny bit easier. So let's move on to number three. So uh, speaking of um, libraries I created, I'm now going to talk about what I consider my magnum opus, a certain magic library. The problem we have, or the problem that caused me to do this is as someone who is doing a bit of JavaScript game development, I'd often hear that you don't want to use the JavaScript array for each map filter if you're working a lot within like an update loop or something's going to be called frequently. Same sort of sentiment I hear a lot, at least in the past with C sharps link. You know, if you're using Unity, you don't want to like call upon that link where for each all these functions, just make a simple for loop and do everything in there. So apparently in .NET 7, link is getting way better. So who knows? Uh, so here's an example in the hacks, how you may do something with an array. Uh, you'll get the array. You'll pass it to filter. It'll filter through the array and iterate through some for loop. Take that array, pass it to map, loop through that array. And then finally filter again, we'll loop through that. And now we have uh, an array of these, I guess, hypothetical entity positions that are just close enough to our target. But that's also three iterations. Probably want to do something like this instead if you're worried about performance. Just do one for loop. You can do all the conditioning you need right here. If you need to reassign or map to another value, just create a new variable. Very simple. But what if we could automate this? We talked about adding features from other languages in the previous part. But now we're going to look at 
taking existing features every language has and just making them that much better in hacks. So I have this idea of converting these method chains to that single for loop. And at first I thought, ah, that's, that's going to be a lot of work. You have to really think about what the human's going to want to write. But when I really broke it down, um, it wasn't that bad. The important part is there's going to be two types of functions we're going to be working with. These are going to be chainable functions. These are functions that also return an array. And then what I call finalizers, which are functions that aren't going to return an array. These would be like contains, index of, find, things that like you're going to use at the end of the method chain. And so I'm not going to bore you with the details of how I parse through the uh, method chain. We're just going to assume I have the name of the method used and the expression it was passed. And we're going to go ahead and use that to sort of construct a for loop. Now, the first thing we're going to focus on is the modifications area. Now, we also have the initialization area and the results area, but these we can just go ahead and default to being an array. So we'll just set our result variable. Let's assume this is like a block scope and it's going to return results. We're going to create a result and push whatever makes it to the end of this for loop. So now we can do things like, okay, well, if we call map, all we got to do is create a new variable, assign it to the callback, and we're good to go. Internally, we'll keep track of the variable so we know what to replace it with at the final part. Uh, we can also do a filter. A filter is as simple as doing an if statement, and if it does not return true, we just continue. And then finally, if we have something like for each, we just call the behavior, and we're good to go. So if we take a chain of these modifiers, this is essentially almost a I guess identical to this, right? Because you're going to go ahead and do this mapping, which occurs here. You know, you're not going to process anything if this condition is false. We'll perform the behavior, which is only going to be performed on anything that passes the filter in the first place. And then finally, we'll map everything to a new type with a new variable. And then using some, you know, easy logic, we can take our finalizer expression and give it that variable we uh, we ended up with right here. Now, on the other hand, let's look at the finalizers. The final line is actually really, really simple because all we're doing is modifying the initialization statement and then the final statement. We don't have to touch anything in the modifications area. So contains, once you call contains, we're done because it's returning a Boolean and that's all we need to worry about. So we just simply set a result variable to false. And if we find our value, we're going to set result to true. And simple as that. Same with index of, we can create a new value called index. We can increment it. And then we'll use the index to assign to our result if we find the value we're looking for. Same with find. Hypothetically, we have a find function that takes a callback and returns the element. Our result variable will just be the element we're looking for, and it'll start as null. But if our callback returns true somewhere around here, we'll assign it to whatever value is currently with the variable. So combining these two things, we get this sort of very simple, very nice to look at uh, chain of methods that we can convert into a single for loop instead of you know, the four for loops that are going to happen behind the scenes in this one. So yeah, I'm pretty happy with this and I use it a lot with my game. Uh, the future is now, we don't have to write for loops anymore. The AI is taking over, it can do everything for us. We don't have to think about it. I haven't written a for loop in hacks in months, except for the ones I wrote in this presentation, but don't, don't think about that. Anyway, if you want to see the full thing, you can check it out. I released the library after extra features called Magic Array Tools, but it does essentially this. It takes, it, you know, it just analyzes your project. It takes these extensions. It's a little complicated. I couldn't really get the macro functionality work, so it kind of uses build macros at some points. But overall, it works flawlessly, and there's even debug features that see what kind of output you create with your method chain. Now, uh, whew, oh, yeah, let me take a quick drink. Uh, okay. All right, number four. So I have these three libraries. I'm doing great. I'm having fun. But let's touch upon something, an issue I had when actually working with Unity. So I made some custom metadata. So what? So I'd have this problem where our hacks C sharp output would output all the fields as public, which is an intentional choice in case you do something like private access metadata. You still want to be able to like controllably access the information and you know, public and private can all be handled within the hacks typer. So I don't mind that. I'm also a big fan of just making everything public anyway. So I don't care that much. 
the issue comes down when I'm creating a Unity component and I click on it in the editor. And now my whole like side panel is filled with all these fields that I just create in this class. And I really don't have any control whether or not they appear there because everything is, because the way it's decided in normal C Sharp is just, if it's public, it'll appear in the component editor. If it's private, it won't. I hope that makes sense. You can override this feature using a C Sharp attribute called hide in inspector. So say, I've got to put public there, but say we have public int p equals five in our component class, then this would hide it from the inspector. But uh, in, in hacks, on the other hand, it's kind of a it's kind of a bit longer thing to write here. Uh, you can see it doesn't even fit in the text box, man. Like this is a lot of stuff I gotta write to make sure my components don't appear. But of course, we're working with hacks. The solution is pretty obvious for anyone who's worked with build macros before. Let's just take a little build macro, iterate through all the fields. I'm not gonna spend too much time on this, but if the meta is equal to no editor, we'll replace it with this metadata right here of meta with Unity Engine Hide and Inspector. We can do an auto build on our mono behavior class, which is what all components um, extend from. And then in our component class, we can do no editor bar is say our points variable, for example. And this will make it so it doesn't appear in the editor. And that's, that's pretty successful, right? But then I thought, man, you really have access to a lot of information in this build macro. Why am I using metadata? Why don't I configure the language to work like I want it to. You know, I had this idea where why don't I just make it so the names decide whether or not the uh, component appears in the editor. Everything will be named normally, but if you start with an E and then a capital letter, that will signify this is an editor value and this can be modified in the Unity editor. Eh, I, maybe I don't like the naming that much. Okay, well, I could also check the type. Uh, this is actually a really great idea. Since uh, the build macros and everything's happening before the typing phase, I could give it this complex type, which is editor dot and then whatever type I want, go through the build macro. If we have the editor type in our typing, we can say, okay, this is going to be an editor component uh, field. Then of course we can use some magic to remove the editor dot part and just make leave it as an int. And then now we have this you know cool little syntax we can use, a bit non-standard, but I still like it. And then of course, you know, I just thought about it and I'm like, you could also just make Unity work like it works for C-sharp. A variable's public, I leave it as it is. But if it's private, I can just automatically add the hide and inspector metadata to every private variable in my class. And then Hacks is just working like C-sharp again. So that's what I ultimately went with, but it really got me thinking like, wow, Hacks is going to work like you want it to. And I think a lot about GD script in Godot, where it's a language that's sort of built around the idea you're working in that editor, but you can do the same thing with hacks and it works great. So yeah, that leads me to, <laughs> that was a, yeah, I guess that was about the beginning of summer where I got to that point and I was very satisfied with that. And then, uh, I don't know, I was pretty happy with everything, but number five is going to, uh, be where I take things a bit further. So I was on vacation. I was like, okay, I'm not going to touch my game for a while. I, I got to you know, sit back, relax. But I had this idea floating around in my brain. There's this function called context.defineModule. And uh, essentially a function lets you programmatically define, you know, an arbitrary module based on data you can construct from all the uh, hacks typings, sorry, all the hacks API. So what if you like made your own language and then parsed it at compile time and defined it in the hacks time? And that, well, is what I did. I eventually created this language called Lax Programming Language. The idea is simple. You, uh, when you create a hacks project and you set your source folder, you know, it's only gonna be looking at the .hx files. Anything else it's going to ignore. So I got to thinking, well, I. There's a there's a function I believe it's a context dot get I don't want to say because I don't remember but there is a way to look at all your source folders. What if I iterate through the files of my source folders myself, get my own language through those folders, automatically compile it and expose it within the initialization phase, and then you just by the time hacks types everything, as far as it's concerned, it's just typing all hacks. 
And so that's what I did. And this is like sort of the ultimate culmination of everything I went through where I just, you know, hacks can do it. Hacks can make it all happen. Uh, I don't want to go into too much. I honestly, I'm running out of time, but I just wanted to demonstrate sort of how that was, it is what it is. I actually don't use lax a lot. It's still very much like an on and off thing I developed in my spare time. But you know, you can just plug it into any project. All you can do is make one lax file in. You know, there's no conflicts, easy to use. I still have an, uh, I'm not a big guy when it comes to Visual Studio Code extensions. I'm not really, don't really understand language servers either, but one day I'm gonna figure out how to do auto completion and errors and it'll be great. But long story short, I see this as a future of hacks. To the new people I was talking to earlier, you really have to understand there's a lot that hasn't been done all throughout this whole talk. Every time I made a library or did a macro, I thought to myself, wow, this really hasn't been done before. How? It, it's so simple. It's so obvious. And, you know, this, I just kept going. And, you know, if you're interested in hacks, you know, and you think your idea is impossible, I don't, just don't. I had the same thing and it really led me on some delays into getting into hacks, but it's possible. You should go for it. Hacks is amazing. Hacks is your dream language. Thank you for bearing with me. And yeah, that'll be all. Any questions? Thank you very much. That was quite interesting to me as well. Um, it almost felt like a Hex feature showcase where you get different great features shown. If we get some nice with Hex, you can do this. It was yeah, really yeah. good. Um, Thank you. I was wondering, I may, maybe I shouldn't be asking this, but you now had five things that made coding fun again using macros. I wonder if that is like a single thing that you'd like to have in macros, which we don't have, which would make it even better. Could you think of something? That's a good question. There's only one thing that I really want. And it's something I tried to implement in LAX, which was a better metadata control. I, w I want, you know, like, I think this has been thrown around before, but like typed metadata, but very specifically like the idea to define like a metadata as a class and have mm -hmm. sort of the functions act as build macros on like the, where it's being called at. So like, for example, I have this idea where in LAX at least you can define like a decorator and in, it works like a class, but if you define any of these three functions on type definition, on field or on expression, then it can process any of those three sort of like components of hacks. And that it just, you know, it's, it's essentially just a, a macro when you really think about it, but I don't know, there's something nice about just having the decorator syntax in my opinion. Mm -hmm. Yeah, tap um, metadata in particular has been discussed a lot before. <laughs> and it's one of these features where I feel like somebody would just have to take ownership get the hex evolution going and say like, okay, we do it like this and then it might happen, but this didn't really happen so far. So we still don't have it. And there are some considerations to be made, but I'm sure we could figure it out. And I don't think there's any particular roadblock that, that would prevent us from implementing it. So maybe okay. if you're bored the next time. You could and the next vacation, <laughs> start the hex evolution. Yeah. Proposal. And yeah, I'll definitely. When are you going on vacation? Oh no, you're American. You don't get any vacation. <laughs> Come on. It's, <laughs> yeah. it's, it's true. It's true. It's true. <laughs> and then I have another another question about your Lex thing because I'm not sure I understood the scope of that. Did you write like an entire parser and everything? Or yes, I did. There's okay. an entire. I mean, I I mentioned it being like a week long thing, but it's definitely been like since maybe like June. I've been working on and off. There's mm -hmm. a whole parser, it parses a whole thing, converts it into hacked expressions. Mm -hmm. And yeah, there's a whole macro system. One of the things I had trouble with was that if you use define module, you can't be defining macro functions in that. So I had to create like a separate mm -hmm. macro mm -hmm. system where I'd be like, okay, I have this macro function. I'm gonna call it on this expression before I put it into the define module. And so, yeah, it, it's as big as a project as it seems, but Mm -hmm. It is what okay. it is. <laughs> That's, no, it's quite interesting. Often projects like that lead to quite interesting results. And of course, it's a lot of work, but it's also quite rewarding. So yeah, that's very interesting. All right. I think with so that. I just want to make sure I understood that the case for hacks is that you can make your own shiny objects to satisfy your shiny object syndrome. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, okay. 
Okay, that's a nice tagline. Okay, then I guess we're ready to move on to the next talk. Yes. All right. So, like, um, yes. thank you, Robert. And um, now it's Jonas's turn.